Thank you for being here. Uh, you are get growing now but through pandemic. You cannot grow more than 50, by the way. Uh, guys, thank you for music. Uh, you, you guys are great. You, know, uh, you did a good job, Dave, uh, doing multimedia. And, and uh, thanks to my wife as well for doing such a great job for, for the church. Thank you again. Uh, let's just go directly. I know we started late. Uh, let's just go directly to the Word of God. I have a message for all of us, including myself. Okay. So when I prepare a message, uh, uh, God, I'm just allowing God to speak to me. And uh, when He opens a scripture for me, He's just directing me to go through that scripture unpack it not only for myself but for the rest of the people so matthew chapter 8 verses 28 we're going to read verse 28 to 34. if you have your bible especially for those who are watching us online get your bible go to matthew is the first book of the new testament when he arrived at the other side in the region of gatherings, not gatherings, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want from us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs were, was feeding. The demon pushes back Jesus. If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And then when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we ask you to speak to each and every one of us. Those who are watching us online, around the world, and those who are watching us right here. I pray that you will encourage each and every one of us, transform us to become the salt and the light to the nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Your divine appointment is the title of my message, that your divine appointment there are appointments, which is just an appointment. You go for your interview, they call it appointment. You have my, I have my appointment for my, with my interviewer or with my boss. That's called just a normal appointment. There is another appointment, it's called divine appointment. Divine means godly appointment. Divine means something either you accepted or you missed along the way 21 year ago i was in malaysia and i was accidentally led into the church and then i met a guest pastor from canada and age 75 or something and they asked me if I want prayer and I said yes I want prayer and they prayed for me they prayed for me but they prophesied over me that I will be a Christian one and a half years later I gave my life to Christ 
many of you know my story through vision and dreams. That was my divine appointment. Someone prophesied over me. Years later, I accepted Christ in my life. I call that as a divine appointment. But it's interesting for me to see that uh, uh, many people and nations nowadays, how they set their priorities. They prioritize wealth over God. They prioritize the opinion of certain people, certain group of people, over the law and the divine law of God. What I'm saying that uh, it's uh, many people nowadays, because we live in a demo democratic country. And by the way, this is so far the best, uh, the best uh, way to come up, you know, to run the nation, which is called democracy. Demo democracy came from democrata. Which is, a, which is a Greek word invented by Socrates and Aristotle almost 200 years or 150 years before Christ. The word democrata invented, was invented by these guys, Aristotle and Socrates, the philosophers. And demo democracy is called the freedom of speech, the freedom of uh, your opinion, your, the freedom of, uh, you know, but if certain group come together and say, oh, we want this, and then they present it to the government, the government has to study that and say, okay, we will grant that one. And we all know that there are many groups nowadays that they come to the nations. Uh, the activists, remember the activists? They come and say, oh, we want our rights. We want to get married, you know, uh, same sex married, all these things. So these are called a group of people. So the opinion, they, they prioritize the opinion of group of people over the law of God. So, and why they're doing that? Because I believe they are, they are scared, number one, of their life. They're scared that people will come and, you know, steal them or rob them or bankrupt them. They, they still, are, they, are, they, are, they have fear of many things in their lives. That's why they are doing that. So some people, they prioritize the religious activity or traditions rather than the sanctity of human life. Religious activity or traditions. You are familiar. There are many religious groups around the world that they are prioritizing their tradition and their religious activity over the sanctity of life. For instance, the, the ISIS is the Islamic group, which is really an Islamic group. Some people, they call them, oh, they are not Muslim. No, they are real Muslims. So they are prioritizing their tradition. They are prioritizing their religious activity over the sanctity of life, which you all know that they go and kill people because they said that these people, they are not a real Muslim. These are called kafir or non-believers. So as per our religious uh, discipline and theology, they have to be killed. So they kill people based on their religion. So they don't, they don't respect human sanctity, right? They don't respect that. And it's not only is Islam. You, you see that in, in Buddhists. You see that in Hinduism. You see that in, unfortunately, in, in Christendom as well. You've seen that many times. In fact, many Muslims, they came and they, they said, okay, so uh, you, are, uh, you are blaming us. Look at your crusade. How many people have been killed through crusade, right? So unfortunately, these are the things that they, they mixed up over the law of God. 
And the law of God, we can find it in, in the Bible only. There is another one I found out that some people, they like, they prioritize the life of animal over human. Yeah? Life of animal over human. In fact, in this country, they sue you if, they, if something happened to their animals, they, they come and sue you. That's why it's, it's so important for them. You know, I've seen uh, when I was passing by this uh, Winston Churchill, I don't know whether you've noticed that sometimes there are a group of people, maybe around uh, 10 or 15, they have a placard with them and said, stop killing the chicken, stop killing the chicken. And then I said, oh, man, through the snow, rain, you know, uh, cold time, winter time, doesn't matter. They, you, you find them sometimes, and not all the time, but sometimes you find them dance. They stop killing the chicken. And I was just thinking to myself, I said, oh, man, there are lots of humans are being killed. And these guys are concerned about the chicken, the delicious chicken that you like, the one that you eat, the oily one, don't go for oily one, the fried chicken, all this good chicken, and this guy said, stop killing them, stop killing them, okay, if you don't like chicken, don't eat chicken, don't eat chicken, but don't come there and then Put the black horse and stop killing the chicken. Whether they, you do it or you don't do it, they still kill chicken. They don't listen to you. And it's amazing to see that, you know, uh, people, they, they, they prioritize many things over God and over human. Human. The sanctity of human. And this is something happened also in this verse. I don't know whether you've noticed that. We're going to unpack it. He said, when he arrived at the other side of the region of gatherings, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs. And I was thinking, what are they doing in the tombs? What were they doing in the tombs? Have you ever asked that question when you read that verse? What were they doing in the tomb? Tomb, where do you, what, what do you find in the tomb? Dead bodies. And these guys were demon possessed, but they were alive. They were not dead, but they were in the tomb. This is where they get their comfort. They get their comfort from the dead people, not from the people who are alive. And sometimes in this generation, you really get your comfort from dead people. Because alive people, they mistreat you, they put you down, they... You know, they steal from you, they don't like you, they hate you. But at least the, the one who is in the tomb doesn't talk, right? So you, you get at least little comfort from that tomb, the tomb, the, the guy in the tomb. That's why lots of people, they go and worship the dead people. You, you find these people in many, many religions around our world, that they go and worship the dead people. Verse 29, it says they were, of course, they were said they were so violent, no one could pass from that town. Imagine you, you have a big town, okay, and these two guys, they were demon possessed, and no one can hold them, no one can hold them, and they were so violent, violent, right? It means no one can reach, uh, come and close to them, and uh, you know you will be killed, you will be injured, right? And imagine that town has these two guys, and you know what happened to these two guys, right? They got healed by Jesus, and instead of the town rejoicing that oh our enemy were you know destroyed and or got healed and stuff, they did not rejoice. They did not rejoice. 21, 29 says, what do you want from us, son of God? Okay, so they recognized 
they recognize Jesus as son of God. Okay. And they shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So you will notice that uh, these guys, these guys, the human being, uh, there was nothing wrong with them. The, the demon inside of them were actually possessing them. So the demon was talking to Jesus. The demon was talking to Jesus and said, Oh, have you come here before our time, appointed time? It means they knew it. From the beginning, what will happen to them? Satan, from the beginning, knew that his place would be the place of torture and hell. From the beginning, they knew it. And he said, have you come here to tor torture us before the appointed time? Verse 30, he says, some distance from them, a large crowd of herd pigs were feeding. And the demon, the demons, okay, not the human, the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us, please send us into the pig. They still want to live. Because pigs are animals and they're alive. They still want to, to live. And so, okay, if you are removing us from this human, at least put us in animals so we can still enjoy our time with animals. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. I was just thinking, okay. They said, okay, send us to the pigs so we can enjoy our time. But uh, Jesus Jesus here, I can, I can see that uh, he knows that the pigs will go to the water and die. And he did it. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in water. Died in water. So the demons, the enemy died, basically, by the word of Jesus, by not only by the word of Jesus, by their own affirmation, because they said, send us to the pigs. And Jesus said, okay, if you want me to send you to the pigs, I will send you to the pigs. So they killed themselves. Jesus did not even kill them. They killed themselves because they just asked permission from Jesus, can you send us to the pigs? So they went to the pigs and the pigs ran to the water and they died. Verse 33, this is amazing. This is something that we need to see. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, the Bible says, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. Then the whole town, the whole town, not only few, the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And then when they saw him, what did they do? Get out of here. We don't need you into our lives. And this is what's happening in our world today. Families, husbands, wives, children, communities, nations, many people. They said, we don't need you, Jesus. Get out of our lives. Even though they have seen miracles. Even though they have seen their, their enemies were defeated. That the enemy is not a threat for them. These de de two demon-possessed men, they were not a threat for the town people anymore. In fact, the other uh, Bible, uh, other gospel, gospel of Luke and Mark also is written that the story. And the gospel of Luke, it says that uh, now they are fully dressed. So they were naked, basically. They were naked and living in the tomb. Now they are fully dressed and they are very calm with Jesus and his disciples. And in fact, they want to follow Jesus. And Jesus turned to them and said, go and tell to people what God has done for you. What God has done for you. And this is what is happening 
with our nations and our world today. So what can we learn from this story? What can we learn from this story? Satan is your enemy. Humans are not your enemy. Okay? Satan is your enemy. He is not only your enemy, but also God's enemy. From the beginning of time, when he rebelled against God, he was thrown out of God's kingdom, and then the only way that he can revenge is through human being. Because God gave human being freedom. He said, go and reproduce. Go and dominate the earth. Make kingdom. And then Satan took advantage of that. And then he came and deceived Adam and Eve. So he became the number one enemy. Not only of God, but of mankind as well. So our number one enemies or enemy is Satan, not human. Jesus did not rebuke these two demon-possessed guys. Jesus was confronting the demon inside of them. And then he removed that demon inside of them. So when we see people around us, when we interact with lots of people around us, if there is something wrong in them, don't put that wrong things in them per se. You know that this happened because of many things in life that happened through their mom and dad or because of the virus of sin. Or all these things happen to them. So if someone is angry at you, if someone hating you, don't attack that person. Don't attack that person. You love that person, but you hate the spirit in that person, which is Satan. And this is what Jesus done, has done, not only to this man, but everybody when he was there healing people. Satan is also the father of lies from the beginning. The father of lies. He lies in many ways. Oh, go and get this one. You know, nobody will notice. Go and uh, do whatever you want in internet. Nobody will notice you. You are alone. Nobody can see that. This is a lie. This is a lie. Why? Because through the lies, he can bring you to his kingdom. Through the lies, he can bring you to the kingdom. You find some uh, money in the house or in your school, and then you immediately, nobody's there, and you take that money, you put it in your pocket. Because, of course, everybody loves money. So you put it in your pocket rather than bringing it to the principal and say, oh, I found this money. Or a gold, or a necklace, whatever, has a value in it. The moment you do that and put it in your pocket, you know that the, you are dealing with the father of lies which is Satan. It means you are obeying Satan now. And then the more you obey Satan, the more you get into his kingdom. And the more you are in his kingdom, then you are not protected by God. You are protected by Satan and lies of Satan. You are protected, but what kind of protection do you have? At the end, of course, destruction. He is the author of confusion, the Bible says. He is the author of confusion. He, many times in life, he is confusing us in many ways. In many ways. Oh, did I marry a wrong person? Oh, did I make a good decision to, you know, have children? Did I do this right? You know, he's the author of confusion. And the reason we are getting into this uh, confusion because we are missing the reading the word of God in, uh, for our lives. So when you miss the word of God, then you are very prone to getting into that trap of Satan, getting to the trap of lies of Satan, 
or the confusion. Anything that is contradictory to the word of God is not from, is from Satan. Anything that is contradictory to the word of God is from Satan. But the question is, how do I know that? How do I know that this is contradictory to the word of God? Unless I read the word of God. So how can I distinguish his scheme? We taught this many, many times in our church that you need to get back to the manual. You need to get back to the manual. Many people, they just buy a TV or a laptop or a computer. They throw the manual. They just began to open it, just do whatever they want to do. And then many times I've noticed that Oh, I came to know that I can do many, many things with my laptop that I did not know. Why? Because I missed reading the manual. Even with the TV, I am sure that you can do a lot of things with your TV, but you don't know it. Especially a smart TV. You don't know it. Why? Because you miss reading the manual. You miss reading the manual. So always remember, Satan is your enemy. Human are not your enemies. It doesn't matter whether they are bad people or good people, they are not your enemies. John chapter 10, verse 10 said, The thief comes only, only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly or to the full. The thief comes, not only sit, sitting down in your house, okay, let's have a game together, let's play, eat something, you know. Thieves are thieves. They just come. In fact, when they come, nobody will notice. You are sleeping. They come to just steal something fr from you, kill you, destroy you. That's his name, Satan, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. The next is Jesus is your friend. And many people, they don't know that. They thought that Jesus is a religious person, you know, uh, you know they have to have distance with Jesus because he's uh, a reverend or is someone who is there and you know I should just only go to him when I have a need or I need a prayer or something he is a little farther and then I'm here no Jesus is your friend Jesus is your friend and some people they don't know that when you accept Christ in your life when he you accept him in your life he becomes your friend he is not only your Savior and King and Lord, He is your friend. In fact, the Bible says He is closer than your brother. He is closer than your brother. He is closer than your husband, closer than your sibling, closer than anybody in your, in, around you. Matthew chapter 15, verse 15 to 16, it says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, appointed you, appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, in my name, the Father will give it to you. Did you see the criteria here? Number one, you have not, God has chosen you. Okay, Jesus is your friend. Jesus is your friend. He has appointed you. It means the moment you receive that divine appointment, the moment you receive Christ in your life, that's called divine appointment. So you have been appointed by Jesus. You have been called by Jesus. Now you are a friend of Jesus appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Okay? 
appointed and bearing fruit. Appointed and bearing fruit. And not only bearing fruit, but the fruit that will last. What are these fruits? We've, we've talked this many times. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, nine fruits of the Spirit. And not only nine fruits of the Spirit, but nine gifts of the Spirit. Okay? Nine gifts of the Spirit. You bear fruits. As a Christian, when I accept Christ in my life, what is my fruit? Love. Love what? Myself only? Of course, I have to love myself before I love others. Okay? That's the criteria. Jesus says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So you need to love yourself first. Then, now you're going to love others. Are you going to choose which one to love? Did, you, did Jesus choose who is going to love or who is going to not love? No, he, he loved every, God loves everybody. How do we know that God loves everybody? How do we know that God loves everybody? The very reason, if you are atheists, if you are Buddhist, Hindus, Muslims, name it. The very reason that you are breathing, it means God allowed you to be on this planet Earth. If God allowed you to be on this planet Earth, it means he did not kick you out. Okay, he did not dismiss you. If a company allows you to work in that company, it means the company still accepts you, right? They did not fire you. It means they still love you. That's why you are working for that company. The reason we know that God loves everybody because we are all breathing now. He did not dismiss us, even though we don't like him. I'm not talking about we here. I'm talking about the other we, other people outside. Fruit that will last. Okay? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. These are the fruit that we need to practice that will last. Okay? How do we know that this will last? We need to practice it. We need to practice it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Are, are you kind? If someone asks you, are you a kind person? What will you answer? Yes. True, huh? <laughs> are you kind? Okay, are we going, I'm going to test you. Okay, if you say I'm a kind person, I'm going to test you. <laughs> All right? Are you a, a joyful person? Do you have patience? <laughs> right? Sometimes? Love, joy, patience, peace. Do you have peace? These are the fruits of the Spirit, and God wants us to have these fruits. And then the moment we have these fruits, what is the promise? Last one. What is the promise? Whatever you ask in my name from the Father, he will give it to you. What is in whatever? What is in whatever? Everything is in whatever. Okay? The reason you don't have this whatever, many of us, the reason we don't have it because we don't practice the fruit side of it. We are already appointed. We are already appointed. We have already accepted Christ, but we don't have these fruits. We don't practice the fruits of the Spirit. The, and Jesus says, bear fruit that the fruit will be last. The fruit that will last. Then, whatever you ask in my name from the Father, he will give it to you. So, Jesus is your friend. Jesus is my friend. Okay, who is your best friend? Jesus. Not darling, not Lucia, not this, not that. Jesus is my friend. Because Lucia may dismiss you sometimes. Put you down. Sometimes uh, say something to you, right? But who is closer than Lucia to you? Jesus, amen? And then lastly, choose one. Choose one. 
really? Can I not just have one little of dark Satan and then little of Jesus here? Can I not love money or, you know, enjoyment and alcohol, smoking and stuff, and then be a Christian? Can I not just be a, you know, a homosexual and then still uh, be Christian? No, choose one. Choose one. You can't. The Bible is very clear. Very clear from the beginning all the way to the end of the book, which is the book of Revelation. Jesus himself said, because not, you are not either cold or hot, you are lukewarm. That's why I'm spitting you out. This is the word of Jesus. Right? So we have to choose one. If we choose Jesus, then is it hard to really follow Jesus? Is it really hard? I don't think so. Did you find it hard to follow Jesus? You are coming here enjoying and you know, the praising God and worshiping God and having our fellowship together, going to Port Hope, enjoying our time together. And we are still Christian, right? We still love Jesus and we are still practicing bearing fruit and uh, fruit that will last. And all of you actually uh, enjoy those, those of you who are uh, uh, part of us in Port Hope, you enjoy it. And thanks for helping us uh, coming to Port Hope for the very first time. And we were all Christians. It's not hard to follow Jesus. But at the same time, it's also hard to follow Jesus because there are some requirements that there are some things that you need to sacrifice. There are some things that you need to surrender, right? You need to surrender your traditions that, you know, is against the Bible, religion that is against the Bible. There are certain things that is against the Bible. You need to let go of that one, okay? It's not really hard to follow Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is your friend. Jesus is your friend. Jesus is not the religious type of guy that is a distance from you. He is your friend. And friend be, uh, are together, right? They are together. James chapter 3, that's my last verse for today. James chapter 3, verse 9. It says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and the Father. With the tongue... With what? With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. Oh, God, we praise you. We praise you. We love you. And with it, I hate you. I hate you. Don't come to me. I don't want to give this one to you. With it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness or image. Out of the same mouth, out of the same mouth, Come praise and cursing. Out of the same mouth come praise and words, uh, cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be clear. It means choose one. Choose one. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same stream? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. If you choose Jesus, remain in Jesus. Continue with Jesus. He is your friend. He is your advocate. He is your savior. He is your Lord. Prioritize him above everything else. How do you know that you prioritize Jesus above your money? How do you know that? Okay, go home. When you are going to sleep, ask this question from God and from yourself. Lord, did I prioritize you over my wealth? Okay, that's a question we need to ask. How do you know that you prioritize God over laptop? Okay, God, did I prioritize you over my laptop, over my, you know, uh, cell phones or, or lap, uh, iPad or notepad, whatever. Did I prioritize you? How do you know? 
that you prioritize God, right? I'm asking my children, did you read your Bible today? Okay, why? Because I want them to prioritize God first before doing anything else. So how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that you prioritize your mom and dad over God? Or you prioritize God first, right? Over your mom and dad. How do you know that? You need to ask this question from yourself, okay? So in recap, what did you learn from this story? When Jesus went to that town, he healed the demon possessed. Okay, he rebuked the Satan, the demons, they were killed, there were peace and joy in that city, but that city chose to get rid of Jesus. Go out of our town, we don't need you. The Bible said they pleaded with him to go out, they pleaded with him. They did not say, okay, go out. They pleaded, oh, please go out, we don't need you. That's called pleading. We don't need you into our lives. Why? It's amazing, right? Why you don't meet Jesus that he came, he did not do anything wrong to you. In fact, he gave you favor by healing this two demon-possessed man, and you still choose to get him out of your life. Please don't get Jesus out of your life. Don't get Jesus out of your life. He's our Lord, He's our Master, He's our Savior, He's our Advocate. And this is not my word, this is the word that we just read, that He has appointed you. He is your friend, He has appointed you to bear fruit. That the fruit will last, and whatever you ask in His name, sickness, ask in His name, money, ask in His name, car, house, Job, ask in his name from the Father, and he will give it to you. But before you're doing that, bear fruits. Can we bear fruits today? Yes. Let's bear fruits. Amen? Let's bear fruits. Okay, uh, that's my closing statement, and I want to pray for all of you, and then uh, pass the mic to Lucille so we can uh, engage uh, to one another. I hope you learned something today. I hope that you will practice it, put it into practice. It's not hard to follow Jesus. Believe me, it's not hard to follow Jesus. You still are the same person, but you only have given your heart to Christ. Your heart has become new only. That's the only difference, okay? God has taken the heart of a stone and give us the heart of flesh. That's the only difference. My name is still the same. Still the same. Okay? God will not judge me saying, oh, why did you not change your name when you become Christian? I don't like this name. God will not judge me. God will always judge your heart. God will always judge our heart. All right? So that's our commitment to God today. Lord, our enemy is not human. It's Satan. It's the devil. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are not. I choose to follow Jesus. I choose to follow Jesus. And I declare that Jesus is my friend. I declare Jesus is my friend. Because he said it. When he said it, I accept it. So Father, I pray that you will draw every man and woman to yourself. So I want to ask everyone watching online, those who are here, just pause 
for a while. Close your eyes and say, God, what are you trying to teach me through this message? What are you trying to teach me through this message? Just, just for it. And my prayer that Holy Spirit will draw every man and woman to the Father. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercy. If we have chosen wrongly, Lord God, if we have not put you our first priority, please forgive us. We want to do it from now. From now on. This is our commitment to you. We want to put your first priority in our lives. Not our husbands, not our jobs, not our wealth, not our cars, not our house. You alone, only. You alone. You alone. That's my commitment to you. And next, I want to bear fruit. I want to bear fruit. I want to be like you, Jesus. The way you love, the way you interact with people, the way you heal people, the way you provided for people, the way you gave. If I have been stingy, please forgive me, Lord. If I have not been generous, please forgive me. I want to be generous like you. I want to be generous like you. I love you, Jesus, and this is my heart. I give it to you. If you have not received Christ in your life, this is a good moment. Just a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come to my heart. I give you my heart, and you give your heart to me. Very simple. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. If you do that, you are a born-again Christian. You are a follower of Christ. You did not enter a religion. You enter a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. May your name be glorified in our lives. I pray for healing over your people. Restoration over your people right now in Jesus' name. I pray that you will provide for them. You will bless them. You bring miracles in their lives as they are being obedient to you and following you for the rest of their lives. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you grace to follow his commands written in the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God loves you and God bless you.